Hello, welcome back to Point of Care Ultrasound. We're going to discuss another case of shortness of breath. Uh, today I have uh, Dr. Mikhail Sepula with us. She's going to talk us through a case uh, that she's taken care of recently and how ultrasound aided in the diagnosis uh, for this patient. All right. Um, so I remember hearing the EMS call come overhead for this lady, um, something along the lines of had reported shortness of breath and when they got there her O2 sats were in the 80s and they had placed her on and on rebreather but seemed to be kind of tiring out and so she was on CPAP which she seemed to be tolerating well. Um, I was on my ultrasound rotation so I just grabbed the machine and headed over to the room and sure enough when she got there um, she was on CPAP, um, looked uncomfortable like she was having a difficult time but uh, was maintaining her oxygen saturations. Um, shortly after arrival, we were able to get her off the CPAP and onto a nasal cannula and kind of titrate her down to about four liters, which she seemed to be tolerating pretty well. Um, she had a history of myasthenia gravis that was pertinent, as well as a DVT on uh, anticoagulation, so differential was pretty broad in her. Um, she'd had previous myasthenia crises um, in the past, but none of which had required intubation. So definitely a thought. So one of the first things that we had grabbed was uh, RT to do um, a uh, NIF at bedside. Um, on exam, otherwise her vitals are listed there. You can pause and take some time to read it if you need to, but hypertensive, tachycardic, and tachypneic. Um, like I said, she looked a little uncomfortable, but and she had the bilateral ptosis indicative of her myasthenia. There's her uh, RT values, the forced inspiratory, um, and a little bit low there, but not too off of normal. And I should say negative inspiratory force. Sorry, that's a typo on my part. So I uh, took the ultrasound machine up and did a point-of-care cardiac ultrasound and uh, got some good views. Started out with the parasternal long axis. Um, on this, you can see it's a little bit limited, um, but you've got a good view oh, of the left ventricle here. Um, kind of concerned about the squeeze there. It's not looking like it's squeezing as well as I would like to, um, but good movement of the valve um, and the right ventricle looked normal size to me as well. Moved over to the parasternal short and same thing, kind of limited view, um, but you do have a good um, partial view of the left ventricle. And I think here you can appreciate as well that it's just not squeezing as well as I would normally expect it to. Yeah, I, mean, I don't know that there's much you could do to optimize this image with those rib shadows the way they are. Mm -hmm. I mean, unfortunately, it's obstructing that one wall. I mean, you could try pulling down a little bit and, and then aiming up, but I doubt that's going to assist you a whole lot with uh, improving quality on this one. Apical 4 was a little bit better, um, and as you can see, you get a good view of that left ventricle and a little bit better of the right as well. Um, same sort of thing, uh, not as good of a squeeze, but not really seeing any signs of effusion either. Our left atrium, I'm going to back up just a little bit here to this view. If you look at the aorta here, the left atrium just looks a little bit bigger. Um, so we ended up putting some color flow, I believe, over this uh, apical view to see if there was regurgitation flow. Um, so we'll see what that shows us here. Yeah. And when we put that color on there, you could see there was quite a bit of back flow coming back in that left atrium. That was concerning for some mitral regurgitation. Her subxiphoid, again, um, we were looking for a fusion here and couldn't really appreciate one. Um, which was good and kind of narrowed our differential. And then took a look at her IVC, which as you can see is fairly dilated without much of a collapse with respirations, um, which is all pointing towards a diagnosis of heart failure, which this patient had no prior history of. And that was our interpretation on this. We called her a severely reduced ejection fraction. Um, you can see that in multiple images there. No evidence of a pericardial fusion, and then that distended, non-collapsible IVC. Um, 
and then after throwing that flow on there, we decided to call um, some mitral valve insufficiency as well. For point of care ultrasound, that's probably all you need to say. Um, you know, you're not going to typically measure the mitral valve annulus and, and do the calculations to grade that, but I think just letting a patient know or your consultants know that there's some mitral valve insufficiency that could be further explored as part of the causes too is, is important. So trying to get into the habit of right after doing cardiac ultrasound, moving on to lung ultrasound. Um, and so in this patient, we started at the right anterior chest. Um, and as you can see, there's our rib shadows here. And then um, there's some B lines shining down like flashlights um, that demonstrate some pulmonary edema. Not too many here, um, but as we'll move to different areas, um, they definitely become more prominent. Here's a little bit lower down in the right side of the chest. Same thing, rib shadows here, and then you can see the flashlights kind of coming through there. Moved over to the left side, and I felt like there were definitely quite a few more beelines that you could appreciate in that area. Same thing, moving down um, even more. We moved over to the right lateral edge, and uh, so that being the mid axillary line. Mm -hmm. um, and same thing, uh, more of those B lines coming down that you can appreciate. And then we found our uh, our liver edge here, so we came down a couple rib spaces on that right lateral side trying to see the diaphragm and that edge of that lung to make sure there's no large effusion down there. Can't really appreciate an effusion at all, but just more of those beelines. And there's a still image to demonstrate that as well. Moving over to the left lateral side, kind of the same as it was on the left anterior. I feel like there's just more um, beelines that you can appreciate. And same thing, moving down a couple of rib spaces to get where you've got the spleen in your view there, looking for an effusion. No evidence of that, but I feel like you've got the most beelines in that image right there. I think if you look at this case, that most of them are at the ba lung bases, um, which is our classic teaching. It is not as overwhelming with the, you know, floor to everywhere diffuse beelines um, being significantly present, but this is an early case of pulmonary edema uh, that, you know, the, it's better to be caught early. I think it's not always necessary to have ultrasound when it's floored pulmonary edema, but maybe this clues you in just a little earlier that uh, this is pulmonary edema for the patient than waiting for that to be floored and, and obvious to, you know, everyone. And there's a still image of that left lateral base as well. So our interpretation for the lung ultrasound was that there definitely was lung sliding present. Uh, there were B lines bilaterally that were worse at the lung bases, which is most consistent with pulmonary edema, but we didn't find any evidence of thoracic free fluid. All right, so in this case, for example, um, why do you think ultrasound helped? You know, this patient had a pretty wide differential with the history of myasthenia gravis. Um, if you looked at the HPI, she had recently been seen and treated for pneumonia. Uh, never really had a diagnosis of heart failure before, but something just didn't seem right on exam. Um, and so I feel like it helped us clue in fairly early on what her disease process really was and helped us direct her care. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I think, you know, it's so easy we get clued into a prior diagnosis um, and we, you know, that is a true diagnosis for these patients and then we stay on that bandwagon or, or keep treating it that way when we forget the other, you know, pathophysiology or pathological diseases can, can occur. Uh, for example, in her, you know, with her myasthenia gravis, her history of PEs, you know, it's easy to put those at the top of the differential, which rightfully so at the beginning uh, deserve to be there. But by using uh, point of care ultrasound, I think, you know, we made a diagnosis that was probably missed days before, which you can't, you know, you can't uh, blame them for that because it's an easy, easy thing to miss with those other, those other comor comorbidities. 
Um, but I think this allowed us to focus our energies on improving her breathing and, and therapies, which she did improve quite significantly uh, quickly. And I think uh, we were able to get her to the floor instead of the ICU, uh, along with um, the, the appropriate consultants for my steny gravis long term. So, you know, I think early institution of ultrasound always is is always useful and always helpful. But I think especially when we're looking at other diagnoses. Um, we can really focus our differential down once we, we institute that early. So, Any other thoughts, Dr. Mikkel? No. Okay, well, Let's thanks for joining this. us this week and uh, going over that. Hopefully, if you have more interesting cases, we can present that so other people have opportunities to learn too. So thanks for your time.